Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, it's a great joy to be with you in your uh, living rooms or in-home worship. It feels like we're having an in-home worship here as well in the studio. There's about seven of us. I've got my son, Joel. Jacob's got his son here. I've got Aaron, Luke, Bert, Sheila. So we're kind of having our own in-home worship service as well as we uh, record this and, and bring it to you live. Um, and uh, for those that don't know you, my name is Richard, and we're jumping into uh, season two uh, of our series called Unstoppable. We, uh, we started this in um, last year, uh, just after Easter, and uh, it's working our way through uh, the book of Acts. And if you're unfamiliar with that, it's, um, it's a continuation of the gospel of Luke. Luke is the author of the book of Acts, and he's really just continuing the story. He's continuing the story of this incredible man, Jesus Christ, and all that he says and does and ministers, except now that Jesus' ministry continues uh, through um, his church, his followers, and his spirit. And uh, Act is a crazy good book to, to jump into, some real powerful uh, stories of, of personal encounters with Jesus, of, of entire communities encountering Jesus. And we're working all the way through it. A lot of people read the book of Acts and think, man, why can't we have church like that today? And I think that's a, a valid question. There seems to be just such a, a dynamism that goes on in the early church. And um, part of that we want to recapture. We want to recap. We have the same Holy Spirit. We serve the same Jesus. And we have similar challenges as they do. And so uh, what I do also appreciate about the book of Acts is it gives also a very uh, honest uh, reflection as well. And not everything was perfect. The, the church was working things out. And part of that you're going to see even in today's passage. And so um, we're going to be looking um, kind of like a part two of, of last week's message. If you hear, we kicked off and we looked at how um, God used a divine disruption. A persecution breaks out in the church. They've been concentrated in Jerusalem, but now they get scattered because of persecution. Real terrible time for the church. People being displaced from their homes, scattered out. But in the sovereignty of God, God really uses that moment to extend this good news, extend the reach um, of the ministry of Jesus. And so we go from divine disruption, and today we're going to look at how that divine disruption really is a divine movement outward of the gospel. And why I think it's applicable, you say, well, what is something that happened 2,000 years ago have to do with us in a totally different culture and time and age? Well, we're also in an age of disruption. And I, I know the first thing that comes to mind is a pandemic, and pandemic is a big one of it. But the pandemic really just accelerated some disruptions that were already in motion. We're in the age of disruption, which means we're in the age of transformational change, change that's happening on a very big scale, so much so that things will look different for the next few hundred years. Um, we're seeing it in technology. We're seeing it in geopolitical circles. Economic change is coming. We're seeing um, in even the church, the disruption that's been brewing and building, especially in North America. And so it was just sped up by a pandemic. And so how comfortable are you with uh, disruption? How comfortable are you when things are shaking? Which is why that first song uh, was so beautiful, because it feels like everything has been shaken. And our firm foundation needs to be in something that's unshakable. And, and for us, that really is Jesus and his word. And it's not to say that like we're okay with disruption. Disruption is disorientating. Um, who doesn't want to have a bit of calm? But at the end of the day, we're not looking to things that can so easily be shaken and disappoint us. We're trying to anchor ourselves in Jesus and what he's doing and how he sees things, even things like disruption. So how will we respond? All right, so join me in Acts chapter 8. It's going to be a long passage, so I'm just going to read it. And uh, we're going to be looking uh, at it today, divine movement, how this gospel through uh, disruption is actually the mission of Jesus actually accelerates. It doesn't get unhindered. It's unstoppable. And so from verse 4, we're going to read to verse 24. And, um, and here we go. It says, Now those who were scattered... Went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Now, just a word about Samaria, why this is so significant. So in Acts 1.8, Jesus had said to his disciples, you're going to bear witness to me. Wait, I'm with the, my Holy Spirit's going to come on you and you're going to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem. But not just yet, to the Judea and Samaria and to the, eventually the ends of the the world. And so persecution is now getting them going with this mission that Jesus had called them to. But the Samaritans were a despised people by both Jew and non-Jew because they were kind of a, a mixed race. They were through intermarriage that had happened previous centuries ago. 
They kind of weren't a purebred of either Gentile or Jew. And so they were really despised. There was an incredible hostility towards these people. And so it's incredible that, um, that the gospel is now going to these people. That Jewish Christian, uh, Philip, the Jewish Christian, is now going to Samaria. Um, it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard and saw the signs that he did for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic, with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Basically, to hell with you and your money is really literally what he's telling Simon. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. We're going to pause there for now. So lots in that story, lots to unpack. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go into all the different directions that story could take us into. But what I want to use this story is to really see how opposition leads to opportunity. And in God's hands, opposition leads to opportunity. We looked at it last week. Divine disruption really leads to destiny, the destiny of the church, the destiny of these followers of Jesus. And this persecution mobilizes the entire church, not just a handful the entire church, and that results in the the gospel movement towards new places and new people. And so I think it's really helpful and handy for us to look at this and see a bit of a framework of how that gospel movement takes place, the nature of it, the nature of the gospel's mission and its impact, but also the messiness that comes with that. You know, so often we think things are just black and white, so clear. If we just do it like this, then everything's going to work out right. And it's very rarely like that. Mission is an untidy um, business. And so I love how the gospel doesn't, the, the, the Bible doesn't shy away from painting a real realistic picture. So the first thing I want to look at is just very quickly the nature of gospel mission, the mission that Jesus has us on. And if I could sum up from this passage what I see in terms of the mission, it's this. It's ordinary people proclaiming the good news in word and deed and contextualized to a certain people and place. So let's break that down very quickly. Ordinary people, Philip. Philip is not an apostle. All the apostles stayed in Jerusalem to kind of ride out the persecution that was happening there. Philip is what we would call today a lay leader, a lay person, a person who's involved in, the, in church ministry, who's involved in, in the ministry, but they're, they're not one of the, 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 the lead leaders. And so I think it's really critical that we see one of the first missions of the gospel outside of Jerusalem is happening through an ordinary person. Because so often we think that it takes extraordinary people to get on with the mission of Jesus. And I think when we do that, we do a disservice and the mission of Jesus is stunted. What we're seeing now is we're seeing a disruption that's really leading to ordinary people being scattered. But as they're going, it says that they're continuing to 
preach the gospel. And so ordinary people proclaiming the good news. So it says in verse 4 that wherever they were scattered, they preached the word. Now, when you hear the word preach, you probably think of maybe what's this is happening right now. What I'm doing now is preaching. Or you hear of, think of a, a pastor or someone preaching behind a pulpit. But the word, the Greek word there is evangelizo, which means e evangelism. It's announcing and sharing good news. It's not the preaching that just comes from preachers, but it's ordinary people announcing and sharing. And what is it that they're sharing? It's good news. I love the description of the good news that Philip shares. In verse 12, it tells us that he preached good news, what? About the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. He preached good news. I mean, just right there, we need to remind ourselves, we have good news. <laughs> we have good news to share. You know, sometimes we think um, God is angry, God is mad, God is, wants to judge the world. I mean, God is holy, God is just. There is a sense of his anger at the sinfulness of this world. But let's be clear, the mission moves forward when we preach good news. And it's the good news of the kingdom of God, how God is ruling and reigning through Jesus Christ, how he's making all things right through Jesus and obviously the name of Jesus. So it's ordinary people proclaiming, evangelizing, sharing the good news in word and deed. It talks about how the crowds paid attention to what Philip was saying when they heard him and saw the signs he did. And so these signs, these miracles in this sense, uh, dramatic demonstrations of the gospel, uh, gave credibility to what he was saying naturally, right? If you're seeing people being healed in front of you, if you're seeing demons coming out of people, people that you knew who were in bondage or addiction for some, all of a sudden being set free, it's going to get your attention. It's kind of how people were enthralled with Simon the sorcerer. He also had signs that got people's attention, signs do that. And so we don't necessarily have to have miraculous signs, although miracles, we pray for that. But what the gospel, the credibility of the gospel gains credibility amongst the people when it's demonstrated, when it's lived out. We've talked about this here in terms of practical ministry, ways in which we can uh, live out and be um, good news people, not just in what we say, but in what we do. And so if people are going to take what we say seriously, oftentimes it comes through, maybe sometimes first, it comes through with how we live our lives or how we're going about uh, trying to bring healing, deliverance into our society, whether that's through programs, whether that's through practical ministry, whether that's through laying on of hands, it's word and deed. And then lastly, it's ordinary people preaching, proclaiming the good news and word and deed contextualized to a certain place or certain people. Uh, mission takes place within a certain context, and that's either through calling or circumstance. Sometimes people get a very deep sense of a calling to a certain people or a certain place. Um, sometimes we land up in a place through circumstances. God uses both. You know, through this, you know, a lot of us, a lot of people in Canada, a lot of people in our church, you're here in this nation, but you weren't born in this nation. Or maybe you were born in this nation, but maybe you didn't grow up in Toronto. But you're here, whether by calling or circumstance, doesn't matter. You're here. God has a reason for you here. There is a context, a people, and a place in front of you and I. And so where to understand the context we find ourselves in in order to bring about this good news, right? Uh, if you, for example, knew in a year's time you were going to go to another nation that spoke a different language, how would you prepare in that year before you left? You probably want to understand their language. Probably want to be able to speak the same language. Want to understand a bit about their history. You'd want to understand how they operate, their culture, what's important to them, that kind of thing. That's called contextualization for mission. Why wouldn't we do that where we live? Why wouldn't we do that to the people around us, trying to understand? So we might speak English, but also we might have to understand what, in what ways do we communicate and what's important in our context, what's important to the people around us. And it's really important to understand this because in, you see such a dramatic impact of the gospel here amongst the Samaritan people. Why? It's because the Samaritans had a lot of similarities with the Jewish people. They, they believed a lot of Judaism. They had a, a couple of different points of contention, which is also the hostility. But they had a similar language and understanding and a similar expectation of a Messiah. That's not the case in a lot of our cultures today. 
right? And so we can't just come in and drop in, hey, here's the good news of the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Like some people might like, who is that? What is that? I have no idea what you're talking about. And so context, contextualizing this good news is important for us if it's going to have a resonance or at least just be understandable to the people and the places that God has us in, either by calling or by circumstance. And so the gospel mission is ordinary people like you and I in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming, announcing, sharing the good news uh, in word and deed and contextualize the people around us to the place that God has us in. And so the gospel seed is scattered and it takes root in different ways depending on the soil. Some places are very fertile, very ready. Some people are just very ready to respond to the gospel. That's amazing. We read a lot of that in Acts. It's just like these people are just ready to respond. And then there's other places it's a little harder. It takes a little harder work and, and we, we don't have control over that. But when the gospel does take root in a person or a place, it often produces the same kind of fruit or impact. So let's have a look at just some of these gospel impacts that we see in this story that also uh, we're to uh, expect as we see God's, uh, uh, the gospel take root in people's lives. First is the signs of the kingdom. One of the signs of the kingdom, people get baptized. That's an outward demonstration of their trust and faith in Jesus. That's why we love baptisms in our church. It's an outward profession of your faith and your trust, turning away from sin and placing your faith and your trust in Jesus. It says that many of the Samaritans, men, women, were baptized, initiated into the faith. Uh, we see healing. We see deliverance. We see all the signs of the kingdom that were very similar in Jesus' ministry, right? We see a lot of healing, a lot of deliverance. What a, it's the sign of the kingdom of God, of heaven breaking in to earth, that there's... Um, that healing comes to physical bodies. Healing comes to us as people. Deliverance, bondage is broken over our lives. Bondage is broken over our communities. You know, this, this Samaritan town was held in bondage because of the sorcery. And we're going to get to Simon a little bit later. But there's a lot of that, just of the, the breaking of the darkness that's held over this, uh, this Samaritan town. And so we see that the gospel has a holistic impact on our person. It's not just interested in a soul being saved, but full healing to this person. Bondage is broken, physical healing. It, secondly, it says there was much joy in the city. Much joy in the city. What a great goal to think of when you go into a neighborhood or a city and want to you know, want to, see, want to see the gospel advance. Like, wouldn't it be great to see my campus, to see this neighborhood, my, the floor, my condo building, wherever you may be, uh, much joy in that place. And sometimes I think we forget about that, right? Sometimes we think, um, you know, that we, we to take the gospel seriously, we are to take the gospel seriously, but not to take ourselves so seriously, but that the gospel, when it takes you, should produce some joy. Should, should produce some joy in that place. What a, what a great testimony that much joy in that city. The third thing we see, we see the signs of the kingdom. We see much joy in the city. What else do we see as the gospel takes root? We see a racial or ethnic reconciliation. This is so huge in our day, particularly here in North America, when we still see, I mean, even on the weekend, I heard the tragedy that happened in Buffalo of that gun, that 18-year-old walks into a store racially motivated, a hatred, uh, hatred for a particular race, uh, black people, and um, shoots and kills 10 plus people. This is real today. And so politicians and people are up on how are we going to bridge the racial divide? How do we bridge the ethnic divide in our cultures, in our countries? Well, one of, the, one of the ways we do that is through the gospel. And so we see Jews and Samaritans who despise one another. We're hostile to one another. We see them being reconciled, what? Through the gospel, through Jesus Christ. And so the, our ethnicities, our racial uh, makeup shouldn't ever be erased by the gospel, but it should always outweigh. Uh, the gospel should always outweigh that. And so there's a pride that we have in our ethnicities, there's a pride that we should have in our racial makeup. But at the same time, it shouldn't be something that's divisive or divides or separates us from one another, especially when it comes to the gospel. The gospel uh, brings people together. It reconciles people together like we see in this story. And then lastly, the gospel produces a unity. Now, it's understandable why Jerusalem, when they're hearing what's happening in Samaria, are perhaps maybe a little bit skeptical of what's going on there. Again, Samaria, Samaritans had a long history there. Perhaps something that we don't fully appreciate, but a long history there, a long history of hostility. So a bit of, 
bit of skepticism there. So they send, they delegate Peter and John, go and check out what's happening, validated or invalidated, but it's important that we have the unity of the church. We keep the unity of the church. And so they go, and, and what happens is probably nothing short of what's been described as a Samaritan Pentecost. Now, this is an unusual and a, a unique event. This is the, not the normative way that the Holy Spirit comes upon a people. Usually, that's accompanied at salvation. But here we do see a distinction in that the Holy Spirit can come upon them. And, and a big part of that is to show that the apostles, as they came, they're representing the church to show a validation of these Samaritans, to show a, an acceptance of them, and to show that they are now one and part of the same church as the Jewish Christians. A massive thing. Jewish and Samaritan Christians are now part of the same church. And the Holy Spirit and the, the gospel breaks down these barriers and validates that and calls them to now operate as one family. And so there's many other things, but these are powerful things. We think about us wanting the gospel to take root in our context, in our place, that we want to see the signs of the kingdom break out. We want to see people experience joy. We want to see neighborhoods have joy. We want to see racial and ethnic reconciliation, all the things that are pulling people apart. We see in the gospel brings people together. We want to see a unity, and it happens as we... Um, Share the good news of the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. And so in summary, we could say that the gospel impact is nothing short of a transformation. But it's a transformation on multiple levels. It's a personal transformation, right? Personally, people were transformed. But it didn't just stop there. A culture, a city in this context, context is being transformed. But it didn't just stop there. The church is transformed when the gospel is shared. There's something that happens in the church that gets stirred up, that gets reminded, that gets them out of their comfort zone. Like, hey, remember what Jesus said? Oh, yeah, I remember him. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Gets them to think differently. And that's what we need. That's what the gift of the gospel is. It transforms us personally, but doesn't just leave us there. It wants to impact and filtrate societies. And even the church, it's a purifying, reforming aspect for the church. And when we lose that, we lose an aspect of that purifying, reforming aspect personally, transform uh, and culturally, as well as in the church. All right. And so the gospel mission and the gospel message, they move forward. It's clear. It's yielding incredible results. Its impact is being felt in this people amongst this uh, in this place, but it's also a messy business too, and it's fraught with some misunderstanding. So let's turn quickly to the gospel messiness, and then we're going to tie it up with the simple act. We're going to come back to that, the simple act that, that initiates all of this. But let's look at the gospel messiness. And I love that this is placed in here. I love that we see a bit of the messiness here, because sometimes we do have a naive um, understanding of gospel ministry if we if we see something working elsewhere, let's just do what they're doing and plug and play, right? Hey, if we just did that, or a lot of people when they read the book of Acts, if we just returned and did what they did. And so there is some truth to that. There's some incredible principles that really undermines the nature of understanding your context, the nature of understanding the people and the place that God's put you amongst. And, um, and it's, it's not all roses. And for example, look at the contrast here. So the same gospel is having incredible receptivity in Samaria, but it's resulting in rejection in Jerusalem. This same gospel is uh, producing death and suffering and grief in Jerusalem. That's where we ended off last week. The, the death of uh, the first martyr in the church, Stephen, resulted in persecution, some terrible suffering, and a lot of grief for the Christians there. And yet we see in Sumeria, it's resulting in life and joy. How do you reconcile those things? How do you reconcile in our world people who are being faithful to the gospel and thriving, prospering, people who are being faithful to the gospel and then being persecuted and suffering? And so it's the messiness of that, that gospel. But also look at a personal, personally how sometimes it's not as clear cut. Look at Simon's character, the, the Simon the sorcerer, Simon the magician. Um, and it shows, I think it serves as a little bit of a warning as well. Um, what is the fine line between a sincere faith or a superficial faith? Uh, there are many different views on whether Simon was genuinely converted or whether he was caught up, maybe it was a superficial. Um, I think it, it, it leaves a bit of a question mark on purpose. 
Because I think we don't want to get in the business of judging who's in and who's out. You can waste a lot of time as Christians, who's in and who's out. But I think it does serve as a warning that um, we're not quite sure if his was a sincere or superficial faith. It, it tends to lean towards him having a very superficial faith. And we'll look a little quickly as to why that is. But look at the messiness. Is he, was, he believed and he was baptized. Now, when we do baptisms, we also we want to make sure people understand what baptism is. We want to hear their testimony. We want to hear how has Jesus impacted your life. We want to understand that they understand what this means, that it's a, a sincere faith. I'm, I'm sure the early church was trying to do their best, but sometimes it doesn't always work out like that. Sometimes you baptize people and you're not sure, and we leave it up to God. And so it says that he believed, and it, it reminds us that there's a spectrum of belief. Sometimes believe means we just agree with Jesus' teachings, but it doesn't maybe necessarily go further and lead us to be transformed by that belief or have a saving faith. You know, James 2, I think verse 19, it talks about how even the demons believe, but obviously are not impacted and transformed in the way that that belief should. And so there is a spectrum of belief. And so it's important for us to, to remember these things. You know, if I look at Simon's life, it's very clear that one of the big idols in his life is power and influence. It comes through his sorcery, his self-promotion. He tells people he's great. He brings attention to himself. Contrast it with Philip, who tells that Jesus is great, brings attention to his kingdom and his works. A real contrast. It's very clear what they're trying to do in this passage. We don't have time to break that down. But his power and his influence comes through his sorcery, his self-promotion. He then sees someone more powerful. I mean, isn't that a testimony that how Jesus and Christianity is that much more powerful than any occultic, demonic power and source? Like, this Simon has a whole city under his spell, literally. And he sees the power that Philip operates in, in miracles. And he's like, oh, I want that. <laughs> what I've got is nothing compared. So that's a great testimony to that Jesus is not just Jesus meek and mild. Jesus is powerful, man. So don't mess with him. But he wants, he's amazed at the signs. Now, signs and wonders, I, I pray more signs and wonders followed my ministry, our ministry. I pray more people got delivered and healed. But signs are that. Signs are a signpost. If you're driving on the highway and you see a sign that says Niagara Falls 100 kilometers, you don't stop your car and like, this is an amazing sign. Niagara Falls is so amazing. No, it does its job. It's telling you about something greater. And so I think what the signs do, they tell us about how great Jesus is, that Jesus loves to heal, that Jesus loves to forgive, that Jesus loves to reconcile, that Jesus loves to deliver. But sometimes we put up the shrine at the signs, and we get caught up in the signs. And signs alone are a terrible foundation for faith. They really are terrible. Unless they, they, their, their job is to point us to the greater, the sign post is it's to point us to the greater. And so maybe Simon gets caught up in this. He looks at the sign, looks at the miracles, looks at the amazing things that happen. And gosh, i got to think, like, I would probably too. Like, it's got to be amazing to see that kind of stuff. But his power and his influence, I want that. And so he even goes to say, I want, can I give you money to get this power? It's just, that's his mindset. That's what you would do as magicians. You would trade secrets. Is like, can I get this, can I give you money to get this power? And Peter just, you know, rebukes him because he can see clearly you've misunderstood gospel of grace, God's gift. You, you, to hell with you and your money. You can't buy what God gives freely. And then even when Peter rebukes him and tells him, repent and pray, ask God for forgiveness, what is Simon's response? He appeals to Peter's power and influence. You pray for me. You pray to the Lord and ask him that none of these things. So in my mind, it shows that Simon hasn't quite fully grasped what this gospel thing is. And so you could say, that Simon has some idols to work through, like we all do, and the gospel's good at revealing those. But he also wants what we would call a Jesus and gospel. I want Jesus and power and influence and platform. And we can all fall into that trap, right? We want Jesus and blessing, Jesus and promotion, Jesus and comfort. Right now it's big. We see um, uh, a lot of the struggle in our North American church, Jesus and political power. Jesus and financial freedom, Jesus and promotion, Jesus and protection, Jesus and fill in the blank, what would it be for you? What is the tendencies of your heart? And that often does indicate maybe some idols that need to be expelled and worked through. And so there are many ways to Jesus, many ways to Jesus. This is an incredible thing. It's a very 
inclusive gospel. There are many ways that people come to Jesus. But Jesus all calls all of us to discipleship. It calls all of us to pick up a cross. And he calls all of us to a path of following him. And so the gospel sometimes is messy. Sometimes um, it's not clear cut. And so we've got to be okay with that. Uh, but lastly, and this is where we're going to end off here. It says, verse 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem. What are they doing? Preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. The gospel movement leads into momentum. Um, okay, for me, what's inescapable in this passage, and granted, I spent a long time this week reading through this passage, so maybe a bit more obvious to me, but three times, the beginning, the middle, and the end, a simple act is the result of all of this. You say, wow, that's amazing, signs of the kingdom, racial reconciliation, ethnic reconciliation, unity, you know, uh, deliverance, joy in the city. We want all that, right? It can feel overwhelming, mission, what are you... What is inescapable from this passage is the simple act of what? Evangelism. Sharing the good news. Verse 4 tells us that they preached wherever they went. Verse 12, it tells us what Philip preached. And verse 25, it ends off. Peter and John, they, they get caught up in this. And they share the gospel uh, as they go. And so if you're like me, you might have mixed emotional response when you hear the word evangelism. I think it can perhaps have different meanings for different people. Perhaps it has some baggage for you, especially for those of you who've grown up or been in the church for a while. Maybe for that, it, it, it feels for you of like a, a, um, a just, uh, I don't know, a, a, a technique, uh, treating people as a project. Uh, maybe it feels like you're manipulating people. I don't know. I know for some people it has a lot of baggage. For a lot of people, uh, a few weeks back, Bert, preached a great message on just some of the hardness of our heart, especially when it comes to evangelism. It talks about fear is often a big one, and your fear of rejection, or fear what, you know, maybe it's, it's going to affect my relationship with this person, or what they're going to think of me, or perhaps it's disappointment. You've shared the gospel in times past. You've been shut down, or mocked, or embarrassed, or it hasn't resulted in anything. It hasn't resulted in, it hasn't resulted in what resulted when Philip and these guys preached the gospel. Um, also, apathy. And distraction or personal struggles, like oh, I'm struggling, you know. And so I think we all understand that. And But here's what's helping me, because I think for me as well, I'm an evangelist, but, you know, I can't help but see that evangelism is so critical to the gospel flourishing in a society. And everyone evangelizes. This is what it's helping me understand is like, Everyone is trying to sell you on something. Everyone is trying to convince you about some hope that they have, some technique, something that works for them. Maybe it's a political party. We're going to elections here in Ontario. I'm telling you, evangelism is happening all the time. They're <laughs> selling you. So don't say like evangelism, just that everyone is telling you about their kingdom. And if you vote for this, do that. The kingdom will come to you. Um, do this lifestyle change. Take this advice. You know, invest in this. Invest in that. And so that could just take a pressure off. Everyone's evangelizing. Uh, we've just got something really good to share it. So I want to reframe evangelism. I'm going to do this very quickly as we run out of time here. Reframe evangelism. Um, some of you might see a, a resemblance to many years ago. A book came out called Becoming a Contagious Christian. And it was a really good book, and just talking about this kind of thing. How do you just get more like relationship evangelism? So I, I kind of upgraded it to something that was a little more, I felt a little more helpful for me. It was a bit more dated that. And so here it is, reframing re evangelism. Evangelism is a bit of a baggage for you. Think of it as relational connection plus gospel conviction plus casual conversation. Relational co connection. Am I relationally integrated with the people and place God has me in right now? Simply just, do I know people who don't believe what I believe? Um, for some of you, the answer to that is no. And, and you might want to reflect upon that. If all the people you know are Christians, all the people that you know, and I'm not just talking about people you know, like have a relationship, with not just people that you meet on the subway or in your grocery store, people that you might see on a regular basis, um, then it's really going to be hard to share the good news if it's just with people who already know that good news. And so am I relationally integrated with the people and the place God has me in right now, the context? Am I in touch with their hopes, their fears, and struggles? 
Someone said, if you want to understand a culture, find out what is their biggest hope and what is their biggest fear. And that's a window into understanding a little bit more about that culture and the people. And I think that's very true. If you get around people, you get to understand what is their biggest hope in life, what is their biggest fear, and what are their struggles. Um, you know, we obviously are coming out of a very difficult time. Relational connection has literally been outlawed for many parts of the last two years, right? Stay distant. No longer. But are you staying socially distanced and disconnected out of convenience or comfort now, right? Or have you been deformed into that? You need to exercise the muscle. I know it takes effort. I know maybe if you're like me, you're an introvert. Your capacity is so low. But you need to exercise that muscle. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've got to get out of comfort zones. You've got to put yourself in places. All right, relational connection. So maybe for some of you, reflect, wow, yeah, I am disconnected with people who don't believe what I believe. I'm disconnected from their hopes and their fears. I'm disconnected from their struggles. Maybe even this week, God will put someone in front of you. It's amazing how God will answer very clear prayers. God, help me get connected to someone who doesn't know you. Second part of it, it's not just relational connection, because then we can just be friends, but do I have a gospel conviction? In other words, is the gospel good news to me? You know, since Bert uh, spoke that word a few weeks back of just a hardness of heart, I think it was following Easter, the hardness of heart, and, you know, for various reasons, I, I've, I've been reflecting a lot on that, on why, um, what is the reluctance in my life to maybe share, and, and it's probably a mixture of all of these kind of things. But it was a really good question, like, is the gospel really good news to me? You know, it's a good question. We know we love Jesus. We know Jesus is, is but is it good news to me still? Um, because you tend to share things that are really good news to you. <laughs> you know, your team wins. It's good news. You share that, right? I know it's a sensitive topic this morning for Leafs Nation. Yeah. I do realize that. Um, you get a promotion. Something happens in your life. That's good news. It kind of just rolls off your tongue in, in, a, in a way. Here's the other thing in terms of gospel conviction. Is the gospel challenging and changing my hopes, my fears, my personal struggles? We're not exempt from those. But the gospel should change how we think about that, especially the personal struggle one. Again, that Firm Foundation song, so great. I have joy in chaos. I have a peace that doesn't make sense. Yeah. That's right, because if we look around our world, our world is in chaos. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be many great foundations for peace and stability. Um, so relational connection, gospel conviction, and then clear oh, casual conversation. And so there's an acronym in every nation called SALT, start a conversation, ask questions, listen, um, tell the story. I think that's a really helpful one. I think asking questions and listening are really helpful. You just get in a conversation with someone and ask them, getting them to speak about themselves is usually just a great way to find out information about them. Genuinely listening to them, genuinely interested in this person that's in front of me. And then finding out ways that you can be sincere and relevant to begin to connect their story with maybe your story and then obviously the gospel story. And so those are things that I'm being challenged in right now. I haven't got it perfectly, but I want to grow in my relational connectedness. There are some people in my life that I am relationally connected who don't believe what I believe. I want to grow in the gospel conviction. I want it to be good news to me. I want it to be shaping my hopes. I want it to be speaking and confronting my fears, and I want it to be helping me in my personal struggles. And then I want to be able to have conversations that just go from just kind of shooting the breeze to a little bit more deeper and eventually it's spilling out of my life, where my faith and my hope comes from. Not in a way that's overbearing or judgmental, but it's sincere because this is who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus. And so I want to pray for us as we end this off. I know we're over a little bit of a time, but I want to come back to this passage. And it shows that the gospel is good news for every person. In fact, season two of this is going to show that. It's just going to go to different people, different places. It's the heart of God. God loves people. We are people. That's where God, the God, He wants His gospel to go. And that the impact of the gospel can be transformational, not just on a personal level, but on a societal level and on a church level. It's true today as it was then. And so I want to pray. I want to pray for conversations, courage, and compassion as we begin to think about how the gospel might want to move 
across our city, across our region, and across our country. Father, we're so thankful for you. We're thankful for your spirit. Jesus, we thank you for your encouragement that you're not uh, you're always with us as we're about your business of making disciples. I pray uh, for those listening today, Father, for courage and compassion um, and for conversations, God, that uh, our faith, our good news would leak out, that we'd have relational integrity with people that we find ourselves amongst, that the gospel we, would be a conviction in our hearts, be speaking to us, and that, God, that you would put us in divine places where in conversation we too can share and proclaim the good news of your kingdom and your name, Jesus, uh, for our joy, your glory, and the good of these people that you love so dearly. Help us. Amen.